Dive into last night. Look ahead. Michael Kasky Blomain, the real Mike KB on Twitter, as only he can, joins us now. The Boardwalk kind of hotline. Have to dive into his brain as we get ready for an epic Game 7. Why are we here? What happened last night? What was different? Well, we know. Joel Embiid didn't have the craps, if you will. His stomach didn't hurt. His knee didn't hurt. He didn't have the flu. He didn't have an upper respiratory infection. He brought it, and Ben Simmons came to play. We knew Jimmy Butler was going to come to play. That's not the surprise. The other two, it's not a surprise. You just, you know, it's like uh, one of the most frustrating things with young players. You just don't know what you're going to get. Let's bring MKB in. The real Mike KB on Twitter. He's on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Let's uh, dive into, well, here we are, Michael. The process has brought us to a Game 7. Amen, right? This is this is what it's all about, Mike. Sure is, man. I know that uh, – so last night, I, I thought one of the things that Brett said last night that stood out to me that gets lost in the sauce a lot of times by just the average everyday fan who just watches games and doesn't care about the press conferences and what these guys say and what goes into all this stuff. But he said he's 22 years old. And his game, as it grows his shot, it tries to get better command of his position and deals with the stage of the NBA playoffs. Shame on us for thinking he's going to be all day, every day. Here he is, and he's just going to go knock it out of the park. It's just not fair. So what he did today was a lot of reasons why he's an NBA All-Star at age 22 as an NBA point guard with the ball. And I thought on the, the missed shots, him pushing it, he was really good. I thought him getting us organized out of our offense after they made – a shot was really good. I really loved his no turnover, and I really loved his offensive rebounds. I thought those two things, amongst all those comments I just made, are what stood out the most. It's the evolution of a 22-year-old, a 6'10 point guard, who used to be a college four-man. Now, there was a lot right there, but that is Brett Brown acknowledging to everybody, hey, we have a 22-year-old kid, and you're going to have ups and you're going to have downs. Let's realize that. But last night, was that Ben Simmons the one that we talk about that if he just gives you that, forget a jump shot and forget all this, that that's the guy that you can win with? Yeah, Mike. I, don't, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily, you know, forget a jump shot, but it's, you know, he affects the game so much when he's not passive and he's in attack mode that it's, you know, you can gloss over the fact that he's not taking or making any jump shots or he can't space the floor because he's affecting the offense so positively in so many other ways. When he's not in attack mode and he's, you know, kind of standing around in the half court and he's not able to space the floor, his deficiencies become more glaring. But when he's, you know, getting out uh, in transition, when he's attacking the rim, when he, like you said just now, when he's getting putbacks on offensive rebounds, things like that, you know, doing all the other things on the offensive end, the Sixers become, you know, that much more dangerous. And, you know, when he plays well, it opens up opportunities for all the other guys by, you know, collapsing the defense. And it's, uh, you know, it's not a, a coincidence that he him playing so well led to the Sixers playing so well last night. Now, when you watch that game, I know Embiid with a plus 40 and what he did on defense was just, you know, really very impactful. But does this highlight almost that Ben Simmons is the most important guy? Yeah, it's, it's tough to say the most important, Mike, because when Joel's, you know, when he's not playing well like he did in the, the past two games, it makes such a difference. But I think the main thing to me it highlighted was that the Sixers can play really well when they're not necessarily asking, you know, just dumping the ball to Joel constantly and, you know, running the offense through him in terms of getting him looks. You know, he only took 14 shots last night. But like you said, he was a, a astounding plus 40. And, he, you know, he made such an impact on the game. A lot of his, uh, you know, a lot of it was defensively. And when he can dedicate so much of his energy and effort defensively and the other guys can pick it up defensively like Ben and then in turn Tobias, obviously Jimmy brought it. Uh, JJ, you know, had 11. He was, you know, does what he does. But then, you know, it just opens things up so much for the other guys. So I think that, you know, Joel at the end of the day is still the most important player for the Sixers. But when he's, uh, you know, when Ben's in attack mode like that, it does, you know, I think it makes them a different team. Yeah, and I know, why do you think that Joel was not able to get going offensively last night? The way that we're like, you know, everybody thinks if the Sixers win, they that he has to score 30 points and 15 rebounds and he has to have that game three uh, effort. Why 
was he not really able to get going offensively last night? Uh, I think, I mean, obviously he has Marcus all on him for a lot of the game. Mike, who's, you know, a great defensive player. He doesn't give up space at all. Joel, you know, Joel can physically, you know, just out, out muscle and out dominate a lot of the other guys like we saw him do in the first round against uh, Jared Allen or whoever else they, the Brooklyn put on him. Uh, Gasol and then even Abaka, you know, they're two of the stronger, you know, tougher, uh, you know, inside defenders in the league. So I think that's part of it. And also is this that the Sixers, you know, kind of like we were just saying, they, they are getting production from elsewhere with a guy like Jimmy giving you, you know, the production that he gave you. Tobias was knocking down shots. I don't think, you know, I think the Sixers right now are at their best when they're not necessarily needing Joel to go out and take 20, 22 shots and give him 30 points. I think, you know, defensively is where he's really making his impact in this series. And, you know, he's t- picking and choosing his spots. He had a couple big threes. He got some and one, uh, a big and one yesterday. But it's not like he's searching out his shots every time. And I think that's part of his evolution, too, learning to, you know, conserve his energy for where it's needed and pick and choose his spots offensively. Because when, when they have weapons like the Sixers have around Joel, they don't need him all the time to, you know, go and get 30. And I think when they're at their best, it's maybe not when he's necessarily doing that. Yeah, and, you know, Jimmy Butler was excellent last night, too. You know, people forget sometimes, though, Jimmy Butler has never been out of the second round of the playoffs. Like, this is a big game. Like, there's the – like, game seven, for no matter what happens to this Sixer team, you're going to have two very young players who finally get a chance to be a part of a game seven in Ben and Joel. But this is a legacy game for a guy like Butler, too, who has kind of been the malcontent and, you know, the guy who um, – essentially has had issues in Chicago and then Minnesota, and now he's here with a chance to say, look, I could be that player that can help you get to a conference final or an NBA final. He's never been out of the second round. So I'm wondering what kind of game, a legacy game this is for Jimmy Butler Sunday night. Yeah, Mike, I think it's huge. A lot of players, you know, don't necessarily get an opportunity to, you know, get to a conference finals, let alone be. uh, Do it in a game seven. Yeah, do it in a game seven and be a you know a legitimate contender to that team. Be like a you know an integral part. So I think the opportunity to you know get you know get to the conference finals in a game seven is something that you know a guy like Jimmy, who's lost in game sevens before but never made a conference finals, who's gotten you know had good teams before all those teams with the Bulls, uh, you know in the early 2010, 2011, those years. Um, you know, but he never got this far. And I think at this point in his career, he realizes the opera. You know, it's not something where a guy like Ben now is only in his second year. He knows nothing but, you know, advancing in the playoffs, playing Jimmy isn't necessarily the same. Same with JJ. I mean, another guy who's, you know, you know, been in the playoffs every year, but he knows how, you know, they've got knocked out in the first round, the second round, you know, plenty of times in Los Angeles. So I think for, you know, a lot of these guys, it's not it's not something that they take lightly. Uh, you know, and Jimmy specifically, like you said, because he's uh, you know, I don't know if anyone's really um, kind of turned around their reputation better this you know this season and this postseason than Jimmy has, considering where his you know kind of the national view of him was right when the trade happened when he left Minnesota, compared to right now where he's seemingly you know there's a few bumps along the road, but he seems to be getting along great with, you know, all his teammates seems to be a great leader both on and off the floor for this, this Sixers team. So I think it's, uh, you know, another chance for him to continue to, you know, make his, make his mark uh, with his free agency coming up. What'd also. you make of, did you see Rondo's comments last night? Yeah. I don't know how much to, to make of that. I thought, well, you know, obviously when I got back from the game later on, uh, you know, I don't know how close him and him and Jimmy are at this point. I, I think it's, you know, that's definitely some speculation that he wants to be in a big market. I don't have any, you know, inside info from Jimmy's camp, but I think, you know, just from, I'm sure you feel the same way from observing him, he seems to be genuinely enjoying, uh, you know, being in Philly, genuinely enjoying, jo- you know, Joel, Ben, his teammates and the, the fact that, He's on a team that has a chance to really make some noise. So, you know, I, I honestly don't know what he's going to decide to do come July 1st. But I think the Sixers have made a, uh, you know, a pretty intriguing pitch to him during the time he's been here for sure. Right. And, and you know, I, I don't, I agree with you. Like, Rondo and him played together in Chicago for one year um, a couple of years ago. So I don't know what kind of bond they formed for him to so matter-of-factly be like, yeah, he's not going back there. But I would say I don't know how important – do you think this game seven is an important barometer for that decision? Yeah, I think it'll definitely factor into it, Mike. I think if 
you know, these guys come out and Joel and Ben come out in this game seven and, you know, just like they did yes last night with the, the attitude of they want to win and they're hungry and, it, you know, whether maybe they win or if it's a close game, I think that could, could affect the way he looks at it. If he looks at, you know, I have two young, hungry players that, you know, something that he didn't feel that he had in, in Wiggins and Towns in Minnesota – uh, and two guys that as he, you know, kind of aging, to, you know, turning into this last contract, you know, age 30, 31, 32, a couple of guys that he knows that can, you know, he can ride, you know, trust and ride for bulk of time in the regular season like we've seen. And then when it's winning time, he can kind of, you know, pick and choose his spots as he ages. So I think, you know, it's a when it comes to winning, you know, depending on how much that matters to him, I think that the Sixers would have to be, you know, pretty high on potential destinations. Now, if lifestyle factors into it, things like that off the court that you can't control, you don't know. But just in terms of on court, uh, you know, the product itself, I would say the Sixers have to be, you know, towards the top for well, sure. Right. And how much, you know, and I mentioned similar to what you did is that he's 29, he'll be 30. If he gets a five year max deal, that, hey, at least I know I'm going to have two young superstar level players all the way through my five year, almost all the way. I mean, Ben could leave, Joel could leave, who knows. But at least when you sign this deal, you're signing up with two guys who are young, it's similar to what. We talked about in the offseason, Michael, about LeBron. Like, if he wanted to come to Philly, right. he wouldn't have had have been the main guy carrying a team all the way through his twilight years. Jimmy can almost be the same way, where I don't have to be the guy every single night with these two guys for the next four or five years of my career. Right. You literally took the words out of my mouth, Mike. I was going to say it's the same logic that we were saying about LeBron last year, where he could, you know, it help him kind of age gracefully where he can still be a, a huge part of a contending team, but he's not having to literally carry the team on his shoulders. And for Jimmy, that would be perfect because as we've, as we've even seen this season, you know, he's not necessarily cut out, not that he can't do it, but on a night in night out basis, especially during the regular season, he's not necessarily cut out to be your, you know, your, your number one option, a guy that's going to go out and score 30 or, or 25 but he is the guy that, you know, in tight situations in the fourth quarter or in a game where you need him to come out like, you know, game six last night and he can do it. So, you know, and it's also two guys that he, after playing with, he trusts. I think he trusts Joel. I think he trusts Ben. So knowing that he has those two guys, like you said, moving forward throughout the bulk of the contract that the Sixers could also pay him the most. I mean, I think all those factors definitely have to, you know, weigh in, in Philly's favor. Yeah, not only that. You know, another guy, Tobias, who, you know, I, I I think we liked Tobias and then we kind of flipped on Tobias. And I don't know that he has been what we thought, but he's only 26 years old too, Michael. He's only been in one playoff. And last night I thought to myself, you know, we're giving Joel and Ben passes for being young and not having a lot of playoff experience. They have more playoff experience. I mean, they have just as much as Tobias does now. So I'm almost willing to kind of pull back a little bit and say, you know what? Maybe Tobias is gaining a lot of experience through this run as well, and to take that into consideration when evaluating him. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, Mike. And I, I would love to have Tobias but, Tobias back. My only concern really is with his skill set on an open market. You know, I do think that the offers offers are going to be there. You know, up pretty high up, and for the Sixers, they just have to evaluate if you know that's the guy that they really want to you know, stake the next four or five years on it with one of these, you know, max or close to max spots, not taking anything away from Tobias, but, I, you know, to me, he, he really looks like a third, you know, fourth guy on a great team, third guy on a really good team, which he is, you know, in here in Philly, which he's perfect for. But when we're talking about allocating the money coming up, you're going to have to pay. Obviously, Joel is taking up. If you're going to want to sign Jimmy, then you're going to need to add some peripheral guys. I just don't know if Tobias is worth the, you know, the investment that he's probably going to make on some team that would be willing to him on the open market. Michael Kasky Blomain at the Real Mike KB, the Sixers tonight setting up a game seven. All right, a um, couple things. I mean, the adjustments have been made, flipped upside down, done over. When you get to a game seven, how many more adjustments are left? One, I would imagine, is. And Ben, I mean, uh, Joel mentioned last night, if they need me to play 45 minutes, I'll have to, I'll do it. He might have to with what's going on at the backup five situation. Yeah, you you nailed that, Mike. I think that was one of the more inter interesting parts of uh, Brett post -game, yep. uh, last night when he was talking about, he's pretty open about it. He said, you know, the team's been searching for basically an eighth guy. He's, you know, they, they tried Boban in there. They went with Greg Monroe for a while. 
uh, you know, earlier in the season, obviously TJ was in the, in the rotation. Uh, he tried Jonathan Simmons in that first two games against the, in the net series. And like he said, no one has really stepped up and grabbed the reins. And at this point, you know, like you said, it's game seven, winner go home. You know, you either go home or you go to the Eastern Conference Finals for the first time since 2001. So, you know, with that on the online, I think you have to get Joel, obviously, as many minutes as possible. And then, you know, my, my main takeaway was we all love Boban, but I think everyone obviously watching that game could see that he was a liability the second he was on the floor. Um, you know, he was a minus 18 in, in like six minutes, I think. I don't remember off the top of my head, but something, you know, really, really bad. And, uh, you know, I think that at this point, Brett just has to trim the rotation. You go with the starting five. Uh, you know, obviously Mike Scott and James Ennis, and then you basically leave it there when you can't, you know, if Joel's out, you maybe you shift Ben to the five spot, you put Mike at the five, you try to go small. But, uh, you know, the, in a game like game seven in Toronto, you can't afford to have a stretch where you put, you know, in, you know, eight points over that course of time. You just can't afford to do it. So, you know, in terms of the actual game plan, I think there's not, like you said, it's a game seven. Uh, you know, you just have to go out there and execute. I don't think there's going to be a huge adjustment, you know, offensively or defensively from what we've already seen. But rotation-wise, I think we'd be pretty surprised if we saw anyone other than those seven guys, uh, you know, playing meaningful minutes for the Sixers. Yeah, I mean, if do you go with Joel and basically play him the whole time, or is there a, a do you you know give him? I don't know. Do you play him forty minutes and give nah. f- eight minutes to Jonah Bolden or something? Yeah, I mean, obviously playing Joel a full 48 is not realistic, uh, you know, as much as you would like to. I think the most that you could really expect him to play and still be productive is probably around 40, 38, 40 minutes, which, you know, for especially considering the fact that he's been ailing, it's a, you know, it's a pretty heavy load. But I think in those other minutes, considering how much Nick Nurse has been matching Mark the Souls minutes to Embiid, the Raptors aren't huge, you know, other than there. I think you could probably get away with either, you know, playing small ball with Ben at that five or, you know, Mike Scott at that five. If you have to reach to the bench, maybe Jonah. But I think, you know, if I were Brett calling the shots, I would try to keep it within those seven guys, try to just right. play small ball and use, you know, Mike or Ben to play play the five. Yeah, which guy other than Kawhi in the game seven situation concerns you the most with them? I mean, we talked about it earlier Abaka has been to the finals, you know, with Oklahoma City. Gasol has been in a couple of game sevens. He's never won one. Lowry's had a lot of failure in these playoffs or past playoffs. Is there a guy, if you were to say, we're going to go all out and take Kawhi out of this thing and make the other guy go, which guy would concern you the most in this game seven situation for them? I think the quick, like, off the top answer would be Siakam, just in terms of he's, you know, if you try to take Kawhi out of it, he's probably going to, he's going to be the next up in terms of opportunity and the guy that could do the most damage. But my answer would probably be Danny Green. I just feel like Danny Green is kind of a barometer for the Raptors. Like, it seems to be when he's playing well in terms of basically when the, kind of similar to what JJ is for the Sixers, like when the opportunities are there and he's making shots, that usually means that the Raptors offense is playing well, they're generating opportunities and he's making shots, which is usually, you know, bodes well for them. And he's a guy that has, you know, obviously several years in San Antonio under Popovich, a lot of playoff experience and game seven at home. A lot of times it's those, you know, it's not necessarily the stars, but those like mid-level guys that seem to really make a difference. And Danny Green is just one of those guys that, you know, kind of concerns me as ter- in terms of a guy that could get hot and really make a difference uh, in that game. All right, Michael Kasky blomain of course, uh, Saturday, uh, Sunday night, right here on 97.3 ESPN. You'll get, uh, now, interestingly enough, 0-1, last time the Sixers, made the finals, they had to go through the Raptors in a game seven, and then they had to go through the Bucks, and that went game seven. So there's a little, some parallels there. Uh, now this time, the Raptors are the home team. That time, the Sixers were the home team. Um, so game seven in Toronto, they won that game in Toronto earlier. They hadn't, so I think that helps them that that, that story isn't following them around, that, oh, they still haven't won in Toronto. So is this team... You've watched them all year. You've been in that locker room. You know these guys. We've seen the ups. We've seen the downs. You lose to Atlanta and Orlando. You beat Golden State on the road. So which iteration of the Sixers do we anticipate seeing? The one that can beat Golden State on the road, Milwaukee on the road, Toronto on the road, or the one that loses to Cleveland at home and Atlanta on the road and that type of team? 
You know, Mike, I, I think you, I got to go with, I think we're going to see a closer version to what we saw last night out of this team. You know, every time I'm actually in the middle of writing something from the site last night with some quotes from last night, but uh, you know, every time this team is hitting adversity in these, in this postseason so far, they've responded, you know, game one against the Nets, they got booed off the, off the court basically and lost. Uh, you know, they they bounced back, swept the series, both as a team and, and individually. Ben bounced back and played well. They got, you know, pretty manhandled in game one up in Toronto. Uh, the next day on all the national shows, people were talking about, oh, is this going to be a sweep? Uh, you know, uh, Toronto has this, basically. And then they completely flipped the script on that, one, two straight. Similar situation when they got blown out in game five. People thought, you know, uh, you know, the series is over. So they bounced back. I think at this point, They've shown that they have the, you know, the mental fortitude to get it done. Like you said, they won in Toronto, so they have the confidence that they can do it. They know, you know, the stakes of it. So, I mean, it's, you can't guarantee a victory in Game 7. It could go either way. But I do think that we'll see, you know, the effort and energy from the team that we want to see, like, in Game 6 as opposed to what we saw in Game 5. Okay. Jimmy Butler, Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid. Who's most important Sunday night? It has to be JoJo, Mike. I mean, he's really the barometer for the team. I think you saw – it's not a coincidence, you know, the past two games that they lost when he was not playing well. And, he, you know, he even made a, a point last night of after the game when they – when I forget, someone asked him how he felt, and he was basically said, I feel great. I felt great all – like he – I think he got the message that, you know, dwelling on how he, how he felt or, you know, talking about it and kind of moping around was having a negative effect on the team. He, you know, made a point of saying, I have to smile. I have to get out there and play well. And he did, and, you know, he was a plus 40, and the Sixers dominated. I think when he plays like that way, loose Joel, that can really impact the game. The Sixers are, you know, they're a plus 80 in this series when he's on the floor. Uh, I think a negative 17 or something when he's off. So, you know, he, to me, is the barometer for the Sixers. If, if they can get a good Joel game, I think they, you know, I think they win the game and the series. All right. That's uh, Saturday night. Uh, by the way, last night, did uh, you, you saw Joel, was he in much better – spirit shape um than he was the other day absolutely mike it wasn't even close he was you know joking around with jimmy he he seemed to be better physically he wasn't he didn't he looked like better not sick he didn't have the bags he didn't sound as like you know stuffed up he, he looked like sounded better and just physically he was more you know jubilant and like to me it really stuck out that someone i forget who it was but right after the game in the in the post game session they were like, you know, how are you feeling today? In the past couple of games, he had, you know, been like, oh, I've been sick, that. And he was just like, I feel great. You know, I'm, I'm great. I feel good. Like, that's it. So oh, he uh, said yeah. afterward, how did you feel in game? I felt great every game. Yeah. All right. In right. your line. So he, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, I think uh, I think he, he's good. Um, so I think we'll, we'll see good Joel. All right. MKB uh, at the real Mike KB on Twitter. And uh, we'll see what happens Sunday night. Lay it out on the line. You can hear the game right here on 97.3 ESPN. All right, brother. We'll talk to you. All right, Mike. Thanks.